Hello everybody, welcome to our discussion of light waves or electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, this will follow your understanding of sound and kind of work our way into understanding light better. So, here we go, light waves. So, the question I think that, that really gets us going here is, how does the sun heat us? We all know that we're warm every day because of the sun. Uh, somehow, that thing that's 93 million miles away gets its energy from far, far away all the way to us. How could that possibly happen? It's really, really far. And most things that transfer energy we think of as being much closer. And I think the best way to start this is to understand how heat is transferred from one thing to another. So heat can be transferred a couple of different ways. One way um, is pretty simple. Um, it's called conduction. If you touch something that's hot, the fast moving particles in that object move into your hand or whatever it is that's touching it and start to speed up the particles there, therefore heating them up as well. Here's a classic shot from Indiana Jones where um, this bad guy reaches down and touches this medallion which has been heated by fire and the heat is transferred from the medallion to his hand. Conduction happens really quickly um, and it's a very efficient way of transferring heat from one spot to another. Um, it's why when you put something in the oven, the bottom tends to burn because uh, that pan gets really hot and it burns or darkens the bottom well before it does the rest of stuff inside the oven. So conduction is certainly not the way that the sun gets its energy to us. The sun's 93 million miles away, and we're not touching it. If we were, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, but conduction is one way of heat transfer, but it can't be the answer for how the sun gets its energy to us. Another type of heat transfer is convection. It's when something that's warm moves. Um, hot air tends to be less dense than cold air, and since it's less dense, cold air pushes it around all over the place, and it ends up moving. And um, either air or any other fluid can have this experience where it moves. And because of that, we see a transfer of heat. So in this case, this woman's opening the oven and the hot air is coming out as cold air rushes into the oven, displaces it and pushes it out. A real typical example of this is a mirage. Uh, during a mirage, you get a very, very hot bit of pavement and the air that's touching that pavement um, gets very, very warm via conduction. When that air gets warm, it rises or gets displaced by the cold air that pushes it out of the way. And the cold air comes down, comes in contact with the pavement, gets hot, and it cycles as the air that gets pushed up cools. And that's an example of convection as well. Again, though, convection can't explain why the sun gets its energy to us. As you hopefully know, there is no air in space. So the air, um, air moving from the sun to us can't be an explanation for why we get its heat. So neither of these work. Neither of these ways um, of getting heat energy from the sun to us can explain it. So there has to be another way. And thankfully, there's a third way that energy can get from the sun to us. Um, again, since we're not touching it and there's no air between us, it has to be something different. And it is. It's lasers, right? Um, or if you will, electromagnetic energy. Um, made popular in Star Trek and other shows, these idea of lasers are this type of energy that this guy is shooting this other guy with, that's electromagnetic energy. And sure, it's, this is a fantasized and, you know, romanticized view of this, but it is the same idea. Um, it's this idea of electromagnetic energy going from one spot to another. So, how do EM waves work? Well, electromagnetic waves, unlike sound waves, are a type of energy themselves. They don't require a medium to travel through. Sound waves are pressure waves moving through air or water or solids. They're moving the particles in the air, water, or solids and causing them to move from one spot to the other, and in the case of sound, bumping into our ears and then moving our ears. That's not how EM waves work. Electromagnetic waves don't require a medium the same way that sound does. They are their own type of energy. They're they don't need something to push through. They are something in and of themselves. Um, they're their own darn thing. Um, sometimes they act like a wave. Other times they act like a particle. That gets really confusing. But the important thing to understand is electromagnetic waves move on their own, um, don't require a medium, and therefore explain how light energy could get from the sun to us. So some other properties of electromagnetic waves. Again, we'll often refer to them as light um, EM waves, the electromagnetic spectrum, all kind of the same thing. So electromagnetic waves 
by and large, all move at the same speed, which is the speed of light. It's incredibly fast. It's about 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, or a whole lot of miles per hour, or a whole lot of miles per second. It's almost instantaneous as far as we can perceive it. Uh, light moves, of course, nothing can move faster than light. It moves very, very fast. And, uh, and this is the speed that all electromagnetic waves move at. So since they all move at the same speed, really the only two things we can talk about that vary are amplitude and wavelength. Now amplitude, a variation in amplitude of the electromagnetic waves, is a variation in intensity. Um, so a bright, bright red light would have a really high amplitude. A very dim red light would have a low amplitude. Same for any other type of electromagnetic wave. Um, a really powerful radio station is going to give a nice big amplitude wave, whereas a very small um, radio is going to give a very small amplitude wave. But the big thing that we're going to focus on is how wavelength affects the properties of waves. Some electromagnetic waves can be up to a kilometer in terms of their wavelength, whereas other ones can be down to a nanometer. So we get very, very large wavelengths all the way down to very small. And because of these differences, we see differences in how these waves perform and what we use them for. So again, um, there are several different types of waves that you're probably familiar with to some degree. Radio waves are the longest wavelengths, followed by micro, then on to infrared, the ones we perceive as visible light, ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma rays. Um, these are the different wavelengths of electromagnetic energy, radio being the longest, gamma being the shortest. The two big things you need to understand when we talk about how waves work is number one, as wavelengths go down, the energy goes up. In other words, they're inversely proportional. Radio waves tend to be low energy, gamma rays very high energy. And as they interact with matter, they can transfer this energy to them. Radio waves don't transfer much, gamma rays much more. Second, um, because these longer wavelengths are longer, they're less likely to bump into things. They're not bumping back and forth, um, potentially bumping into um, other particles. Think of a crowded hallway back in the days when we used to have those at school. If you're a student walking through the hallway and you take one big sweep from one side back to the other as you work it down the hallway, you're not going to bump into too many people. But if you go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth down the hallway, you're going to bump into a lot of folks. The same is true for light waves. Um, the wavelengths that are longer are more likely to pass through media, whereas those that are shorter, like X-ray and gamma rays, can get blocked easier by, by walls or trees or lead aprons or you know. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through and talk about each of these individual wavelengths in some detail. Um, you're welcome to research some and frankly expected to do that um, as you work on your wavelength projects, but here we go. Okay, so remember that these two big rules, wavelength goes down, energy goes up, wavelength goes down, ability to pass through things goes down. So let's start with radio waves. So radio waves are our longest type of waves. Um, they can have a wavelength from a kilometer down to a meter, so they're very, very big. And because of that, they have two really important properties. First of all, because they are so long in wavelength, they don't have a lot of energy. And since there's not a lot of energy, there's very little potential for harm from radio waves. If I shoot you with a radio wave gun, it's not going to do much to you. Even if those particles hit you, they're not going to transfer much energy to you. So it turns out that the second, th and the second thing about radio waves is they're likely to pass through media. Um, if I shot you with a radio laser, it would probably just pass right through you. Chances are it won't actually even hit you at all. Um, same thing is true for walls and buildings and whatever. Radio waves can get through a lot of material. So because of these, they're perfect for communication. And that, of course, is what we're used to when we talk about radio waves. Um, radio waves can travel long distances without, getting bump, without bumping into air or walls or whatever. And so they can pass right into houses and get picked up by our receivers. So number one, they, they can get through stuff. That makes them good for communication. And number two, they, they don't hurt us if they bump into us. So low energy, easy to pass through things, radio waves are great for communication. And that's why we use them on our radios. Um, they're also really interesting in uh, high distance astronomy. When we talk about very, very far away objects, 
um, those things are emitting electromagnetic radiation. And even though space is mostly empty, there is some stuff there. And so if you have shorter wavelengths, they're more likely to get distributed and not get to us. But radio waves from things that are very, very far away are more likely to get to us. So we can actually use radio telescopes to look at very distant objects and see what they look like. Um, so this is a picture of a radio telescope dish, and this is what they typically look like. So radios are great. Um, radio waves are certainly important in astronomy, and they're very important in our communication. Okay, moving on. Um, the next shortest wavelength are microwaves, and they're from one meter all the way down to one millimeter. Um, microwaves are similar in properties to radio waves, just a little less extreme in both. They aren't quite as good at getting through stuff, but they carry more energy. Um, we can use them to heat food, as I'm sure you well know, we use them in microwaves, but probably the most interesting thing we use microwaves for is our cell phones and our Wi-Fi. Uh, Wi-Fi needs a little bit more energy because we're sending so much information across it. So we use microwaves instead of radio waves to get more energy moving across and more information. The problem, though, is they're a little easier to block. I'm sure you've been in spots in our school or in other places where the thickness of the wall blocks those microwaves. They wouldn't block radio, but they do block micro. Um, and that's why they're a little less efficient in terms of getting through things, but they're efficient in terms of getting a lot of information across. So microwaves, good for moving information, still really good um, as communication because they can get through most things and they tend to be relatively low energy. Moving on, infrared wavelengths from one millimeter down to 0.7 millimeters are typically what we think of as heat. We give off infrared waves. Um, we don't give off visible light. We don't glow, if you will, but we do give off infrared light. And this infrared light is perceived as heat. Again, more so than visible light, this can pass through media because it's a longer wavelength. So we can actually use um, use special equipment to see through walls where we see the infrared light that's coming through a wall or coming through a ceiling. This is how we found Osama bin Laden and often uh, do raids because you can see the heat energy that's given off by people through the wall because those longer wavelengths can actually get through the wall. There are some organisms that can perceive this. There are some snakes, some pit vipers that can actually see, if you will, um, in infrared waves. It's also what we use for night vision goggles, um, and it's useful in astronomy as well. Um, they're, they're shorter wavelengths, so they're not quite as big a focus as radio and micro, but they're useful as well. So infrared, heat, just a little bit longer than visible light. And that, of course, brings us to visible light. Visible light is a relatively short wavelength, uh, 0.7 millimeters to 0.3 millimeters, and these are the waves that we perceive with our eyes. Um, obviously really important to us in communication um, and perceiving our world, we see them across the spectrum. Um, to talk in a little more detail about visible light, we can talk about the longest all the way down to the shortest wavelengths of this relatively small section of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. The longest wavelengths of visible light are red, the shortest purple or violet, and everything else along the rainbow is in between. The common Roy G. Biv Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, describes the waves from longest down to shortest. Incidentally, if you want to know why the sky is blue, it's because of this. Our sun doesn't give off much purple, but it does give off a lot of red through blue. In, so when that light comes into our atmosphere, our atmosphere, the water and the dust and the nitrogen and oxygen and whatnot, tends to be more likely to bump into those blue particles because they're shorter wavelengths. The blue particles get scattered, and only the red ones make it through. That's why we have a blue sky. It's also why the sunset appears red, especially when it's really cloudy or smoky. Near, when it's super, super smoky, all of the wavelengths get scattered except for the longest and reddest ones, and they're the only ones that get through, resulting in that blood-red sun that we sometimes see. But those are the visible waves. Um, it's why the sky is blue, short blue wavelengths, why sunsets are red, long red wavelengths, um, and those are, of course, very important to us. Moving on, we get to some of the shorter wavelengths. And the next wavelength, just a little bit shorter than violet, is ultraviolet. And these are getting down to less than a millimeter and, of course, um, are higher energy than visible wavelengths. When we start talking about being harmed 
by electromagnetic waves, usually we start our conversation with the ultraviolet. If you are out in the sun too long, it's the ultraviolet rays coming in from the sun that are burning you. You're also more likely to get burned if you're at a higher altitude because less of the ultraviolet light is scattered by our atmosphere than it does it out at sea level. Ultraviolet light, short wavelengths, but high energy. Um, we can use UV light to kill things. Um, we can sterilize systems with ultraviolet light. You can shine UV light on bacteria and it kills them. Um, so it's actually a way to radiate or to um, sterilize some of our food. There are some organisms that emit light in ultraviolet ways. Um, the, there are some organisms that emit ultraviolet light as well. Um, things that glow under a black light are giving off UV light like scorpions and stuff like that. Moving on, x-rays of course are really important to us in our daily lives because we use them in the medical field. Again, just understand these properties again. They're high energy but unlikely to pass through things. We use them because when we bombard our body with them, uh, they often get blocked by parts of our body, we reveal the bones, and we can see them on a photo plate. That's why they're great for taking a look at our, our relatively dense bones. Um, it's also why when we get x-rayed, people will put a, like if you're getting your arm x-rayed, you get this nice little lead vest to protect your internal organs. It's also why the x-ray technician leaves and goes behind a screen, because they don't want to get bombarded with x-rays every day. We're really lucky on Earth that we don't get bombarded with these because even though our sun gives off a lot of x-rays, they get blocked by our atmosphere. They're long enough wavelengths, they have trouble getting through our atmosphere and getting down to us, like ultraviolet does. X-rays are great in astronomy because objects that are very far away often give off lots of x-ray energy. Problem though is you can't use a telescope on Earth to view objects in the x-ray because the x-rays get blocked by our atmosphere. So we use x-ray space telescopes to look at objects in the x-ray range. Um, but they still reveal a lot of information and they're pretty fascinating. Finally, we have gamma rays. And gamma rays um, are super important rays. They're, they're the highest energy wavelengths, so therefore the potentially most harmful. We typically think of them associated with nuclear energy. Um, when there's a nuclear explosion or nuclear radiation, it's the gamma rays that interact with our cells, cause mutations and harm us. When doing astronomy in the gamma range, again, you have to be in space looking at these objects. Um, they're important because they're so high energy, uh, but they're not here on Earth to a large degree coming from the sun because they get blocked by our atmosphere. But when we go do space travel, it becomes an issue. We need to make sure that we're blocking these gamma and x-rays that are blocked by our atmosphere here on Earth. And those are them. Those are the different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, hopefully that gives you a good introduction.